obesity and chronic diseases is expanding around the world. Cancer rates and heart attack rates are climbing in countries around the world. We used to eat more primitive diets and more rich in produce, and now we're eating less produce and more processed foods. So in other words, it's this combination of um, plant produce, in other words, how much produce a country eats, natural plant foods, and how much processed foods and animal products they eat. In other words, I'm classifying food into three basic categories. Natural produce, processed or refined foods, and animal products. And worldwide, as processed foods and animal products go up in a diet, and produce goes down accordingly, these diseases of chronic, these, these diseases of nutritional extravagance go up in direct proportion. Heart disease and cancer and diabetes and obesity go up in direct proportion. We have to reduce processed foods and reduce animal products. And in their place, eat more natural plant produce, which have the full plethora, as you said, of, of antioxidants and vitamins and minerals and fibers and resistant starches and that, that humans need for maximize their health. Now, lots of investigations in modern times have shown that as people eat more animal products, especially animal protein, and reduce plant products, we have higher rates of cancer and higher mortality, all-cause mortality, which increase death rates. So the, the problem is a lot of popular books have been advocating more animal products in the diet and eating less processed foods. And even though more animal products and less processed foods may enable some people to lose some weight, it's not good for long-term mortality and morbidity. It should be less processed foods and more unprocessed vegetation, like beans, nuts, and seeds, and, and squashes, and plant foods, not less processed foods and more animal products. That gets people into trouble. And we have to do something to oppose the, this type of message because it's unfortunately killing people. And well, there's lots of mechanisms we're understanding today which higher levels of animal products contribute to disease. One mechanism is that higher amounts of animal protein, because it has a high biological value, raises a hormone called IGF-1. And as IGF-1 goes into higher levels in people's tissues, it's a growth-promoting hormone that also resembles the insulin molecule. So it promotes the growth of fat and the growth of mus muscle tissue, yes but it also can promote the growth of, of tumors and cancers as well. So it has angiogenesis promoting, means it promotes the growth of blood vessels to fuel tumors, and it promotes cellular replication or cellular division as an adult, which is not favorable. So animal protein, which used to be looked on as so favorable to maximize muscle growth, now we know is not favorable. It's better to maintain your muscle size and growth with more plant, with more, um, with more non-complete plant proteins less biological value, because when the body mixes, mixes and matches the proteins, they're utilized by the body more slowly, and it doesn't it cause excessive growth to promote cancer. So that's one way. We also know that saturated fats do are not, not just promoting high cholesterol and heart disease, but they also promote cancer replication. In other words, saturated fats are pro-inflammatory, and they also promote cancer. Also, there's pro-inflammatory molecules in the bacteria that, are, that live in the digestive tract when you eat a diet high in animal products, and also excess iron from meat also is pro-inflammatory and promotes heart disease and cancer as well. There is some trans fat in animal products, but most trans fats come from, are, aren't most trans fats, that's not the source of most trans fats in people's diets. So I don't think that's the major mechanism. I don't think blaming an individual for their issues, whether they're a drug addict or a smoker or they're overweight, is really the answer or the solution. It's neither. Well, people need information, they need the right information. And every person has an, has an inside that's meaningful, and they don't want to be sick. They don't want to have diabetes. People don't want to have a heart attack, and people don't want to get cancer. The problem is, number one, they're not given the right information to make the right choices about their lives. Number two, there's so much confusion they can't make sense of what to do. Number three, when they go to their doctor and get it and have high blood pressure or diabetes or a problem, they're given medications and not told that lifestyle interventions are more effective. The diabetics aren't told they can reverse their diabetes. The heart disease patients aren't told that nutrition works more effective than angioplasty or bypass surgery and even by the drugs. And the overweight people aren't given it the right solution, how to get rid of food addictions and food intolerances. Then, you know, in other words, the solution they've given so far have been inadequate. People need better information. We have to arm people with the right information so they have a better chance of this working for them. There's always people that are going to be smoking cigarettes and using drugs and eating, and, eating, and eating in an addictive and unfavorable way, but at least we have to give them the right information. They don't have to, so they can choose not that if they want to. Well, the, what sells as a book generally isn't, how should I say it, uh, um, a marker of how correct it is or how important it is or how effective it is or how safe it is. And often what might be effective in the short run isn't necessarily safe for people in the long run. We know, for example, that these, for example, the high-protein diets that were in vogue for many years cause increased risk of sudden cardiac death, irregular heartbeat. You know, more, they, they increase the risk of cancer. They're particularly dangerous. So whether some person benefited from it from the short one and lost some weight is almost irrelevant. In other words, 
I think there are three basic um, nutritional points that 90% of the non-commercially influenced, non-industry-based or non-biased nutritional science would all agree with. Three basic points. And if every American knew these three basic points, we wouldn't have so much confusion. Number one, we need to eat much more plant food, unrefined plant food, like fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts and seeds, you know, onions, mushrooms, we need to eat more unrefined plant food, especially greens, beans, nuts and seeds. And no nutritional scientist the world over will disagree that people eat too much processed foods and not enough unrefined plant food. No, that's the first thing. Number two, the processed plant foods, the high glycemic carbohydrates, is not just diabetes and heart disease and obesity promoting, they also promote cancer. No disagreement. High glycemic sweets, sugar, white flour, white rice, cancer promoting, not a part of any diet. And number three, we have to eat considerably less animal products, not more. This idea that people are eating more animal products is irresponsible and dangerous for the population. People have to reduce their animal product consumption significantly if cancer rates are going to come down. So those three things, more produce, less processed foods, less animal products. Almost all nutritional scientists in the modern world today agree with those three basic tenets. Yes, I, um, I'm talking about diets usually fail, meaning caloric restriction, fad diets, going they fail in the long run. People can't sustain them, they're not healthy. And also, they yo-yo the weight up and down. And trying to eat less calories is trying to tell you to breathe less oxygen. You can, after a few minutes, you'll be gasping for air, and people can't sustain. And so what makes my approach different, which I call a nutritarian diet, I use that term nutritarian to define a diet rich in nutrients. And that's the thing, because nutritional deficiencies are ubiquitous across America and the modern world, and those nutritional deficiencies lead to perverting cravings and desire to overeat foods. So number one, I want people to eat healthfully, eat foods that are rich in nutrients, and meet the human's, human's needs for micronutrients. That's critically important. And the other thing is we're talking about how food can be tremendously addicting and how without addressing the nutritional quality of food, all diets are going to fail. And without addressing people getting rid of people's food addiction, all diets are going to fail. So, and you fix addiction by addressing nutritional quality and people getting, being able to stay away from eating the foods that, are, that, are, um, pow that, are, that set off addictive signals in the brain. So a combination of nutritional quality, nutritional excellence, getting enough volume of high nutrient foods, meeting the comprehensive nutritional needs of humans, and being able to understand, having the person understand what causes emotional overeating and food addiction enables them to put together a program that can, that they can achieve success. Well, actually, there's been some studies on, on a nutritarian program. We just finished a study that's going to be published shortly in a medical journal that showed that, that, that showed that the average person lost over 50 pounds and maintained it. This is the person with a BMI over 30, lost over 30 pounds. People with a BMI of 25 to 30 lost somewhat less pounds, about 30 pounds. But we followed them for years. And we found that these people maintained the weight loss for two, three, up to five years. They didn't gain the weight back. So the majority of people, were, so the people that, that got the benefits sustained it, but they didn't see it as a temporary fix. They were learned about the whole program, not just to lose weight, but also the long-term benefits of the program to protect against dementia, to protect against cancer, to get them to, to run against stroke in their future. So people made the dietary change as a permanent change. Learning to eat a nutritarian diet is to eat, with, eat a more natural diet. So people following a nutritarian diet aren't doing it just to lose weight. They're doing it because for a multitude of benefits they're going to get out of it, and they're going to do it long-term and for the rest of their life. I call my latest book The End of Dieting because I think it's really important people get off the dieting merry-go-round and realize that we're not talking about going on a diet, we're talking about eating a healthy diet for the rest of your life. These people, because diet, the word diet has two meanings, right? One is you do something temporarily to lose weight, and this is not that. As opposed to eating a healthy diet or a nutritarian diet, something you're gonna, that describes the way you eat in general, that you're gonna do, that we all should improve our diet, not go on a diet, improve our diet to the point we can live with it, and live with it in a way that's healthy for us to live for the rest of our life. That's the key. And because we talk about the word diet, because people go on and off these bad diets that are bad for their health, that cause them to yo-yo with their weight, which is even worse for their health, and, it, and, and can't be sustained. Um, yes, I have numerous books where super immunity have focused on the immune system and anti-cancer effects. And the end of dieting, though, um, excuse me, the end of diabetes, though, I focus, I target the diet particularly for those metabolically challenged and diabetic patients to make it more glycemic favorable and more aggressive so it very effectively gets them off their medications, lowers their blood pressure, reverses their heart disease. So it's the, the most strictest version of my diet. In some of my books I may, I may allow a little more bending of the diet, not to be quite as strict, to reach a broader audience, let's say. 
But in the end of diabetes book, the diocese is focused on exactly what to do if you're a type 2 diabetic. How to eat if you're a type 1 diabetic. How do you eat if you're a, a gestational diabetic. How does the doctor wean, down, you, wean you down off the medications? What's so dangerous about taking those particular medications for diabetes as opposed to using diet and exercise to get rid of it? It could focus more on that particular condition and very informative and motivation for both the patient and the doctor to use this approach. Well, I would disagree with that statement you just said, because you said most doctors putting people with diabetes on a diet that's low carb and high fat. Mm -hmm. I think that's changed tremendously in recent years, and more and more doctors are recognizing that eating high fat foods and eating animal products in particular have pro-diabetic effects. There are studies that show that the more meat you eat, the more you become diabetic, too. So we're talking about the fact that I don't put, we're not vilifying all fat, because the fat from nuts and seeds have anti-diabetic effects. Whereas the fat from oils may have pro-diabetic, and animal products may have pro-diabetic effects. So we're not talking about taking all fat out of the diet. We're talking about devising a diet with the right type of sterols and stanols and fibers and resistant starches and phytochemicals and polyphenols that have anti-diabetic effects. And so it's using modern nutritional science to target a diet style that maximizes a person's chance, opportunity to get well from diabetes, and it's incredibly effective. I did a pilot study where um, where 11 people became non-diabetic. And one, the one that was still on medication, didn't need it anymore, but the doctor left them on. So you say 10 out of 11 became non-diabetic. And they're saying non-diabetic, meaning that they their hemoglobin A1C came below 6, their fasting glucose averaged below 100, and they no longer needed medication anymore. So the he average hemoglobin A1C went from an average of 8.4 seven months before, and their average hemoglobin C afterwards was 5.8, over seven month, average seven month, as the medications were, were taken away. So we're off medications, their blood pressure went down as the medication was withdrawn, their cholesterol went down as the medications were withdrawn, and their diabetes reversed itself as the medications were taken away. So we're talking, and now we're doing a major study, you know, more a control trial, larger control trials as a result of this study. The point is, is that um, it's extremely effective, and we have the case histories and the data to show it works. Thousands of people have done it already. And now to make it more acceptable to more of the medical profession and the people out there who are more... Um, we're harder to convince and more looking for more data. We're putting that, those studies together in the future, too, to, with more, more um, dope-controlled trials. Now, some type 2 diabetics can be on insulin. It doesn't make them insulin-dependent, a type necessarily, mm -hmm. because they could be using insulin and could use another drug, an oral medication, right. instead of insulin, let's say. Right. They, so, but a type 1 diabetic usually has a failing. The beta cells in the pancreas produce no insulin, and they are truly insulin-dependent. And the type 1s, this, this nutritarian approach is so important for a type 1. It's not going to take away, their, their, take away the need for insulin. They might need only a third to a quarter as much insulin, but they still then require some insulin, but more physiolo physiological normal levels. And they won't develop the morbidity and early life mortality. In other words, they won't develop the nerve damage and the blindness and the amputations and the heart, early heart disease and the, because the excess use of insulin in type 1s to cover their, the needs of their, their diet, which is unfavorable shortens their lifespan, increases the risk of cancer, accelerates atherosclerosis. I, so this program is so important for the type 1s, as, just as important for a type 2. The type 2s can get totally well and be non-diabetic. The type 1s will still be diabetic, but now they can have a normal lifespan, which is so critically important. Well, beans are a, green vegetables, beans, onions are favorable foods for, a type, for, for all diabetics, but beans are a superfood, and they're the, they're the number one high carbohydrate food choice. In other words, we all need carbohydrates, we need some fat, we need some protein, we need some carbohydrates. Out of those some carbohydrates you're going to eat, which ones, if you're diabetic, should you eat more of than others? And the ones you should eat more of than others are the ones that have the lowest glycemic effect, most fiber, most resistant starch, and most nutrients. You know, because we can, use, we can score carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of those that are highest glycemic, lowest in nutrients and fiber, and those that are lowest glycemic, highest in nutrients and fiber. And that puts beans at the top of, this, of the list. That's a very good question, because it's very important when people start this program, they reduce the medications immediately at the very beginning. We often cut their, when people come and see me, the first day they begin the program, I cut their medications, the diabetic medications, back in half on the very first visit, because they can develop hypoglycemia the second day. So it's important that when people start this program, they notify the physician, and they get, they get communication, that they're and they're monitoring their sugars more carefully, because we don't want people to become hypoglycemic, or even for the blood pressure to go too low. And it's not, we're not just talking about reducing their diabetic medications, their blood pressure medications has to be reduced as well, because this program is so effective, people can lose 
you know, an average of seven to 10 pounds the first week of doing the program. And then they can, their blood sugars by the second day, they could have a hypoglycemic episode or a hypotensive episode, they didn't change the medications. So the first two weeks are particularly important to lower the medications right away, to want, even with the lowering of the medication, to watch them carefully over those first one to two weeks to make sure more further reductions are, ne are, ne are not necessary. Because um, the side effects of medications can be enhanced if you're over-medicated, and you can become rapidly over-medication, over-medicated on an approach that is, that is aggressive. Well, when talking about cancer, it's, it's a difficult question to discuss completely because um, there's a point in our lives where we're healthy and have no cancer. And then we all should be eating healthy, not wait to changing our diet after we get cancer. We should be eating in a right to prevent cancer. That's when diet's most effective. But then, along the way, most Americans develop cancer as cells in their body. And even, way, even if you have a normal mammogram or a normal PSA, it doesn't mean you don't have breast cancer. Most adult women in America over the age of 60 have breast cancer. They just can't pick it up on a mammogram because it takes 10 years for those cancer cells to coalesce large enough to, to be seen by the human eye on a, on a, on a radiographic um, test. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making is that the earlier stage the cancer is, preferably before it's diagnosed, that's when nutritional interventions are most effective, and that's where G-bombs, G-B-O-M-B-S, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds, eating a diet with these high-nutrient anti-cancer foods is so critical. Once you have cancer, is it too late? Are the effects of eating green vegetables and berries and mushrooms and onions have no positive effect for the person? Is the person just waiting to die at that point? No, that's not true. The studies do show that even with the diagnosis of cancer, this approach is extremely effective. There was a study on flaxseed in women showing that six, after six weeks of being on a muffin that contained flaxseed, they showed apoptosis and, and anti-proliferative effects. In other words, their breast cancer stopped replicating and a lot of the cells were dying. We're showing when we put together a portfolio of these anti-cancer foods that includes mushroom and raw onion and flax and chia seeds and, and cream cruciferous vegetables, there's a lot of ability of the body to to um, reduce the growth and even kill cancerous cells and bring people back to normal again. A lot of women with breast cancer can see that a certain percent of those cancers go back the, and go back the other direction, can become non-cancers. We don't want to give up, but we do have to recognize that the more advanced the cancer becomes, the less probability of that occurring is. So the earlier in life you start this, the better. You know, not all cancers are going to be reversible, but you still don't want to give up because the body still has the potential, especially in early stage cancers, to, to, to help the person tremendously. Well, don't forget, I recommend that all people eat an anti-cancer diet. You asked me a question, right. well, a person has cancer, what's the minimum of this food or that food? Well, don't forget, I don't recommend people who only make these changes if they have cancer. I want everybody to eat them. So I want everybody to eat at least an ounce, but preferably two ounces of nuts and seeds a day. I want them to eat at least one or two tablespoons of ground flax seeds or chia seeds a day. I want everybody to eat at least, you know, at least 10 grams, but preferably like 20 or 30 grams of mushrooms a day. I want everybody to eat half a raw, half an onion each day, and you know, part of that, at least a quarter of an onion raw, but at least they eat a total of half an onion. Like to go, have a goal of eating half an onion each day, cooked onion, but, so, but at least some of it raw in a salad, some raw onion every day. I want people to do at least a, you know, a giant salad every day with a nice size serving of raw cruciferous vegetables like shredded cabbage or kale or bok choy or arugula or watercress, some raw greens every day. You know, I want people to eat some berries or pomegranate each day, at least a cup. I want people to eat a, you know, a half, at least a half a cup of beans each day, and especially a colored bean, like a red kidney bean or a zuki bean or a black bean or a navy bean. I want people, no, in other words, I want everybody to eat this way, not just people who have cancer.